Is there anything new to say about the Titanic tragedy a hundred years later? The commentary that intrigues me most was made by the satirical newspaper, The Onion. World's largest metaphor hits iceberg. And that's what the Titanic has been. It's been a symbol of many other things. We think we have learned the lesson because we have read so many books, we've seen so many films. There's a whole library on the subject. But what do we really know about it? I think the interesting question is how the people of the time, without having seen the films, without having read the books, without knowing what was going to happen to the Titanic, how those people thought of the world of the sea. And that's what I'm going to try to do now, to look at the picture that the owners, the officers, and the passengers of the Titanic had, remembering the saying of the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard that life is lived forward but understood backward. If we think of the Titanic that way, the ship in the event will not just be a metaphor, but it will be a lesson in how today we are facing the concrete realities of our own time. The Titanic is a metaphor for failure, among other things. But what kind of failure? Was it simple class arrogance? Or was the problem really the system? Or was it both? When we look at the Onion headlines, we see the popular impression that this was a total failure of an elite to take into account the feelings and the safety of itself and especially of the poor. And so there are two models of the Titanic. The first might be called the populist wedding cake model, that the people at the bottom, the 99%, were treated inexcusably by the 1%. The second has been called by organization theorists the Swiss cheese model of disaster. And in the Swiss cheese model, it just happens that all of the safeguards that were in place against a tragedy like this happened to fail at the same time. If you picture a block of cheese, usually there is no hole that goes all the way through the cheese. But once in a while, if all the slices align in the right way, there is a path to disaster. And that is the question that students of the Titanic are facing. At the time of the Titanic, the two interpretations were roughly reflected by public figures in the United States and in England. In America, it was Senator William Smith who led the congressional investigations of the disaster at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel shortly after the rescued passengers arrived in New York. In England, it was Lord Mercy, who was the head of the commission investigating the wreck. There were two very different people with different motives. Senator Smith was one of the first members of Congress to begin what became a major feature of American public life in the 20th century. The congressional investigation that sought not only information as prescribed in the Constitution, but also exposure. Exposure of incompetence, of greed, of treason. It was really one of the original media circuses. Lord Mercy had a different bias. He was doing his best to uphold the honor of British seamanship. And his commission reached a very different conclusion from the American report. It adopted what today is called the Swiss cheese model, that tragic decisions were made, bad decisions were made. But generally, everybody was following the best knowledge of the time. We've learned more. Things have to be changed. We have to move on. But we can't judge people by hindsight. These were the two interpretations. And the interpretations survive today.
The filmmaker James Cameron is responsible for the most influential popular image of the Titanic today. And he's very much in the camp of the senator. Third class people are vital and heroic. First class people are oppressive and sexist. And the people in steerage are left to die while the people in first class manage to rescue themselves. There is some truth in that, but it's also exaggerated. For example, nearly twice as high a proportion of the third class women on the Titanic survived as the first class men. And in fact, the lowest proportion of survival was of the second class men for complex reasons. But that just shows how it's hard to make that kind of generalization about the Titanic. On the other hand, there are respected figures today who are very close to Lord Mercy's position and who in fact even uphold the idea of the gallant people in first class who sacrificed themselves for the greater good. Mark Stein, a columnist, has compared the heroism of the Titanic with the panicky behavior of the people on the Italian cruise ship Costa Concordia, of which I'll be speaking in a minute. In academia, there is even a respected economist, Bruno Fry, who has resurrected the idea of the English as a race of gentlemen with a sense of fair play suggesting that their lower rate of survival than that of the Americans is proof of this. It would not be a good crisis without villains. In our own time, in the crisis of 2008, it was the Ponzi schemer Bernard Madoff. In the time of the Titanic, it was Sir Cosmo and Lady Duff Gordon who were accused of escaping from the ship in a lifeboat with only 12 people on board, accused of having bribed the crew to row away from the ship as quickly as possible, not picking up anybody else. And they never quite lived down the hearings, although they continued to protest their innocence. There was a basis in reality for Senator Smith's characterization of the White Star Line, though. For example, in the monument in Southampton to the dead of the Titanic, it is only the engineers who are honored. The ordinary crew members are not present at all among the names that are inscribed. In fact, the White Star Line even sent bills to the survivors of the heroic bandsmen who, as everybody who has watched Titanic films knows, were playing until the very end. The White Star Line considered them to be second-class passengers rather than crew members, and it sent the survivors bills for the uniforms that were lost when the ship went down. If the Titanic hadn't sunk, would we remember it? I'm not sure that we would. And the reason was that the Titanic was the latest, but not necessarily the greatest ship of the pre-World War I years. Already, when the Titanic was launched, there were even larger German ships on the horizon. There was a rivalry in ship construction in the civilian as well as in the naval sector between England and Germany in the years before the First World War. The German ships, in fact, were more advanced in the way their rooms were arranged. For example, in the Titanic, the old arrangement of gentlemen retiring to a smoking room after dinner and ladies retiring to a lounge were kept, whereas in the German ships, there was already today's pattern of mixed entertainment after dinner. Even in the domestic 
quarters, the Titanic was really not quite up with the times. For instance, in 1910, there was already a British hotel, the Goring, which still exists today, that had a private bathroom for every room. And yet on the Titanic, even in first class, most of the staterooms did not have private bathrooms. One of the Titanic collectibles sold after the expeditions is the chamber pot. So the Titanic was not our idea of luxury. In fact, if we're looking for a ship that corresponds to the classic picture of what a great liner should be, we have to look ahead to the 1930s, to the so-called ships of state that were heavily subsidized during the Depression by nations that were trying to create employment while opening up showcases of their arts and crafts for elite travelers from around the world. The greatest of these was the French ship Normandy, which was launched in 1935. And if you compare the dining rooms of the Titanic, uh, here shown in a photograph from the Olympics, since there's no corresponding picture from the Titanic, to the three-story Art Deco dining room of the Normandy, you'll see that there's really no comparison. And yet, the staircase of the Titanic, because of the ship's tragic fate, has always seemed the essence of luxury to generations. Fortunately, much of the decor of the Normandy was removed when the ship was being refitted for military use in New York Harbor in the Second World War. And a fire broke out and destroyed the ship. But enough of the wonderful artwork and design survives to give us an idea of just how luxurious it was. This, for example, is a mural of the history of navigation. You will not find anything like that on the Titanic. The real question of most people about the Titanic is how anybody could have been so foolish as to disregard the warnings of icebergs and proceed at full speed. And some people might consider the Titanic as an example of organizational failure, like the tragedy of the Challenger, which was shown in hearings to have originated in the determination of NASA officials to proceed with a launch despite warnings that the cold weather was likely to weaken the the O-rings and produce a disaster. The Titanic was definitely not like that. The captain was one of the most respected of the White Star Line, Edward Smith. And he said in 1907 about the class of ships to which the Titanic belonged that he could not imagine the circumstances in which such a great ship would founder. Those sound like famous last words, but we have to look at them in the context of what newspaper accounts and magazines had to say at the time before the Titanic was lost. We have to look at them in the light of the practice of the sea in 1912. At that time, captains were fearful but they weren't fearful of icebergs as much as of fog. The iceberg was a known risk, but large ships were thought to be able to survive collisions with icebergs. A German ship, the Kronprinz Wilhelm, for example, had survived a 1907 collision with relatively minor damage. But what really alarmed the seafarers of the Titanic's era was fog. And you can see this yourself on the road. What's the most frightening condition you can encounter? To some people, it might be ice on the road. But when there's ice, you still have visibility. Everybody is slowing down. Everybody is careful. But when there's fog, 
it becomes very difficult to see if somebody is coming up on you. And it's hard to slow down because you're afraid that if you slow down too much, somebody else is going to hit you from behind. So the fog is really the metaphor for our ignorance of our surroundings. And captains were so concerned about it that there were special chairs on the bridge called fog chairs. And sometimes the captain would sit in them for up to 36 hours while navigating through fog. The Titanic sank on a still night. The waves were calm. There was no moon. But visibility seemed to be excellent. What the captain and the other officers on the Titanic didn't realize was that in these conditions, icebergs were much less visible than they would have been in choppier water when the line of waves breaking against the iceberg let lookouts see them at a greater distance. The lookouts later testified in London that if they had had binoculars, those were not available because of a mix-up on board. If they'd had binoculars, they might have been able to see the iceberg sooner. But experts on navigation disputed that, and they said that binoculars would not have made a difference because they're useful only when you have spotted an object. They tell you its details, but it's like pointing a telescope at the sky you really have to know what you're looking for first. I found an article in a young people's magazine, March 28th, 1912, a few weeks before the launch of the Titanic. It's called The Safety of the Ship, and it is about the hazards that captains face at sea. And the hazards really amount mainly to fog. There is no mention, by the way, of the Titanic. It's all about the class of the great ships that were being constructed internationally. So if we see the world that Captain Smith came from, there is really no reason for him to pay extraordinary attention to the ice warnings that he had. He was certainly aware of the danger. But paradoxically, it was his extra experience that made him, in hindsight, so complacent. There was another nearby ship, the Californian, that many people at the time and since have said should have known that the Titanic was foundering, should have come to the ship's aid, uh, disregarded the signals. And that's a whole controversy in itself. But the interesting thing was that the Californian had virtually come to a standstill because of the ice. The Californian's captain was in his 30s, relatively new to the sea. And the sound of the ice clanking against the ship terrified him. But Captain Smith, as a veteran, was following the universal practice of going at full speed through ice packs. Experience had taught everybody that this was not such a great danger, and the passengers expected to arrive on time. One of the most important things about the new class of superliners dating from the mid-1890s was that they could keep a schedule as a train did. If you were going in an old-style sh sailing ship, you could not really count on getting to your destination at a certain time. Also, the passengers on the Titanic were sending many telegrams. There were people waiting to meet them. They had business to do. They were really part of the new 20th century world of rapid communication and transportation. Now imagine if Captain Smith had decided to be extra cautious, had a premonition of an iceberg disaster, and had reduced the speed significantly. Let's say that the Titanic had steamed into New York Harbor a few hours late. 
or more than a few hours. What would people have said? They wouldn't have thanked the captain and the White Star Line for saving them from a disastrous collision with an iceberg. They would have apologized to their friends and relatives for not being there on time. And they would have muttered to themselves that this old guy who was about to retire was so concerned about his bonus for accident-free service during the year, so concerned about getting the title of Commodore when he retired, that he had inconvenienced the whole ship. And suppose the White Star Line had relaxed its rules about first-class passengers not mixing with third class. What would have happened? If those regulations had been breached, everybody might have had to get off at Ellis Island and go through a full inspection. It wasn't snobbery on the part of the White Star Line that segregated the third class passengers. It was actually the regulations of what became the United States Public Health Service. In 1891, as immigration was rising, new legislation said that because of the crowded conditions in third class and steerage, the passengers from those categories had to be kept separate from the rest of the ship so that those passengers in first and second class could be visited briefly in their cabins and cleared, and everybody else could be sent to a special inspection station. The Titanic raised another issue that we can best see in hindsight, and that is scale. It's well known in engineering that new designs keep getting bigger and bigger as architects and shipbuilders get more confident until they reach a point when something goes wrong. And this happened as early as the Middle Ages. The magnificent choir of the Cathedral of Beauvais, one of the greatest works of the era, collapsed in 1284, only 12 years after its construction. The reason was that that wonderful innovation, the flying buttress, which allowed unprecedented height and unprecedented light, turned out to be inadequate in high wind. How could the architects have foreseen winds like that? In hindsight, we can say they should, but cathedrals had been getting bigger and bigger without any ill effects. And even today, the conservation of the Cathedral of Beauvais is a major job for engineers. Connecting the flying buttresses, for example, our metal supports, indicated by the red arrows. And in the interior, there is wooden bracing. So it's very hard for designers to say when something gets too big. There was a history in the 19th century of ship designs that revealed fatal flaws. Steamboats, for example, were notorious for explosions. You can read all about that in Mark Twain. But the most deadly accident of its kind in American history actually occurred at the end of the Civil War, not as a result of military action, but during the transportation of released Union soldiers north in a ship called the Sultana. The Sultana exploded in 1865 with a loss of 1,800 lives. The Sultana was partly a Challenger-style disaster Boilers, for example, had been patched with thinner metal so that they were vulnerable. But it was also a matter of the behavior of the passengers themselves. The ship had a capacity of 376, but by the time it sailed, there were 2,400 on board. 
the soldiers did not mind the crowding. They wanted to leave as soon as possible. And of course, the ship owners who were being paid by the government per head rather than per voyage saw an enormous profit in it. So what seems to be a matter of pure greed and incompetence also involves a certain matter of shared understanding. It was more important for the soldiers to get away quickly than it was to wait and have a safer journey. But of course, these were people who had been exposed to all of the deadly fire and the horrific prison conditions of the Civil War, so their behavior is understandable. In the early 20th century, the greatest disaster was the loss of the General Slocum in 1904. The General Slocum was an excursion ship that operated in New York waters and in this case, it was carrying members of a Lutheran church on their annual festivities. When a fire broke out, the captain did not make landfall immediately. The fire continued to burn, and over 1,000 lives were lost, again, more than on the Titanic. It turned out that maintenance of the ship and especially of safety equipment like life vests had been seriously deficient. For example, the life vests were made with inferior cork and it was even said that iron bars had been put into the life vests to bring them up to the specifications. The Titanic did mark a new stage of accountability though. In the case of the General Slocum, the owners of the company and the suppliers of the life vests were never convicted. Only the captain was, and he was later pardoned. By 1912, there was more indignation, partly because more elite people were involved. They had lawyers. They could press their case. They could appeal to popular opinion. And the difference between the Titanic and the General Slocum also illustrates something about the sociology of disasters. If people who are part of a tightly knit community die together, that's as great a tragedy as people from all over the world. But in memory, it's very different. In memory, it's a relatively restricted circle of family members, friends, and relatives who are mourning. In the case of a transatlantic ship, the disaster affects people from all over the world. So it's likely to be covered more widely by the press and remembered longer. And that's one of the things that has made the Titanic stand out in history, while other tragedies, like the General Slocum and the Eastland, which we will see in a minute, are forgotten. There may be no greater challenge in thinking about the Titanic safety than the question of lifeboats. Why weren't there more? One answer that's often given is that the White Star Line was simply too cheap to install them. But that doesn't make much sense because lifeboats were comparatively cheap compared to the total price of the ship. And if passengers, who were already quite concerned about safety, could be reassured by having more lifeboats and lifeboats for everybody, then the ships would have included them as amenities just as they included others. So how did people really see lifeboats at the time? The first thing to keep in mind is that lifeboats obstructed the view from the promenade deck. Passengers wanted the view, especially first-class passengers. So anything that 
diminish the amenities of the ship was discouraging to passengers. The second fact about lifeboats is that since the North Atlantic shipping lanes were heavily trafficked and ships had radio, it was thought not necessary to have lifeboats for every passenger because the rescuing ship would have lifeboats of its own and the function of lifeboats was really to ferry passengers from a stricken ship to the rescue ship. The purpose of the extra bulkheads of the Titanic and other ships of its kind were not necessarily to prevent all sinking, but to assure that if the ship was going to go down, there would be enough time for the orderly evacuation of all passengers. Of course, that did not prove to be the case. Additional bulkheads were needed, but the concept has remained to this day. Lifeboats are really not considered the essential elements of safety. And in fact, another tragedy in 1915 bore this out. In Chicago Harbor, another excursion ship, the Eastland, capsized while being loaded. And more passengers died in Chicago Harbor as the ship rocked back and forth and ultimately capsized then were lost on the Titanic. Why did the ship capsize? Well, there were a number of reasons, but one of the most important was that additional lifeboats had been added after the sinking of the Titanic, and the reinforcement of the decks to accommodate the lifeboats, plus the weight of the lifeboats themselves, made an already top-heavy ship even more unstable. When you add to that the fact that the trip was very heavily subscribed and that the passengers were unfamiliar with ships and life at sea and started to panic and amplified the movement by rushing from side to side, you had another kind of tragedy that paradoxically may have been caused by the lifeboats themselves. The most serious problem with lifeboats, though, may have been that many ships sank in a relatively brief time in which orderly loading of the lifeboats was impossible. This was the case of the Lusitania, which was torpedoed in 1918. Sociologists and economists who have studied disasters like that say that behavior is very different when people are panicking, when everybody is making their way to survival. The rules of chivalry are disregarded. People really don't even have time to think about them. Everybody is struggling and scrambling to get above the decks to find some kind of lifeboat space. There is no way for the crew to conduct the evacuation in an orderly fashion. When a ship sinks in 15 or 20 minutes, people don't deliberate, people don't think about ethics, people are out to save themselves. And this is one of the most serious defects of lifeboats, that when the emergency is greatest, this form of safety protection is least useful. The point of Lord Mercy's hearings was that while the actions of the White Star Line and the Titanic's officers were understandable, the future needed better rules. The future needed better technology, more watertight bulkheads, more lifeboats, and the public generally accepted that. People were not reluctant to travel by sea. In fact, as we've seen, the 1930s were the greatest age of the superliner, the greatest age in history.
But what have we really learned from the Titanic? One example of what the reforms could and couldn't do occurred in 1956 with the sinking of the Andrea Doria. By the 1950s, ships had not only radio, but radar. And yet, this event has been called a radar-assisted collision because of misunderstandings among the officers of the two ships, but especially because the ship that rammed the Andrea Doria, the Stockholm, had a radar that had two different scales, one a long distance scale and one a short distance scale. Because the radar could work in two modes, the Stockholm's radio operator thought that the Andrea Doria was much more distant than it was. And that was a major factor in the disaster. However, one difference between the Andrea Doria and the Titanic was that nearly all the Andrea Doria's passengers could be safely evacuated to another ship. The reforms after the Titanic then were successful in saving lives. On the other hand, the new technology also created the possibility of new kinds of errors. But there was another class of post-Titanic disasters. And it came from the development of new classes of ship with risks of their own that departed from the classic superliner pattern. One of these is the so-called roll-on, roll-off ferry, which has a bow that can lift for accommodating automobiles and trucks and other vehicles. This is a very efficient way of transporting people, but it's also a risky way. And the reason is that those open decks and the arrangements of the bow and stern can permit water to accumulate on deck, and that water, in turn, can easily destabilize the ship, causing further disasters. And that's exactly what happened. In 1994, a ferry operating on the Baltic, the Estonia, sank amidst high waves because probably of this kind of interaction between the ship's design and the movement of water on the deck. Over 850 passengers were lost. That's again more than on the Titanic. In the case of the Estonia II, the lifeboats were a very limited use. This time they were constructed of rubber. Most of them, they were easily swamped in the chilly waters, and most of the passengers, in any case, were really unable to escape from the flooded body of the ship into the lifeboats. After the Estonia, many naval architects now believe that it is better to concentrate on the survivability of the ship than on the means for escape, since in extreme cases, it is very unlikely that people will be able to reach the lifeboats at all. This brings us to the latest great marine disaster, the loss of the cruise ship Costa Concordia off the coast of Italy in January 2012. This was another type of post-war ship developed in the late 1890s. And we've seen in the case of medieval cathedrals and of the great liners that after 10 or 20 years of a new technology, as its safety record develops, as people are building bigger and bigger, that there's often a point at which something goes wrong, some effect that people hadn't realized. Investigations are still underway in the case of the Costa Concordia. We're not even sure how many lives were lost, probably around 20 or 30.
Yet the evacuation was so chaotic, there were so many accusations, the passengers were so upset that it's likely to be the Titanic of our time. One of the interesting questions on the Costa Concordia, which like the Titanic had an experienced and well-regarded captain, was the role that new technology played. In this case, the advanced navigation system called ECTIS that the Costa Concordia had on board. This system integrates charts, GPS, and radar, and it's supposed to give excellent warning of any hazards ahead. Uh, the captain has insisted that this navigation system wasn't working properly, and in fact, questions have been raised about how accurate the base maps in today's advanced technological navigation equipment really are. We have to wait for the results of the investigations, but the debate about the Costa Concordia is a reminder that safety technology always has problems of its own, and it's a reminder of the remark of Lewis Carroll's Red Queen that here it takes all the running we can do to stay in the same place.